Hello, my name is Adam Bean and welcome to the 48th edition of Airhex TV. And uh, I'm just around the, um, just after the uh, airhex.com regular workshops at the airport Munich. And um, what we did, we uh, covered some uh, web stuff. And what I decided to do is uh, to split the workshops into two parts, very similar to the Java E workshops. So the first one uh, is like the bootstrap Java E, where I show all the APIs from uh, from JavaScript, CSS, web APIs, service workers, offline apps, offline caches, um, whatever you need to build an app. And the second part, uh, uh, and also web components, uh, the technical stuff. And the second part is what you can do with uh, to build or how to build uh, web apps just using web standards so no additional libraries with uh, custom elements or web components and service workers and web workers and so forth and um, so i actually wanted to name the first uh, the first workshop java e bootstrap uh, so, sorry web bootstrap the problem is of course there is a bootstrap framework uh, twitter bootstrap so um, i just renamed that to uh, web essentials and the next one is effective web Okay, the next workshop is uh, around the corner, is the um, the remaining, you know, 20%. So what I still think is with Java, it covers 80-90% of all cases. But what happens if you need, for instance, Kafka or uh, distributed uh, caches or uh, whatever you may need, which is not part of Java, so I will cover as, as, as many such uh, uh, technologies as possible, even OpenShift clouds and so forth. So, and uh, in winter, there will be the uh, regular winter edition of Java EE uh, um, Bootstrap and, um, sorry, architectures, microservices and performance. So uh, the last winter, so in 2017s, it was overcrowded. So the um, so if you would like to attend, please book early. So now let's start with the questions. So the very first question, Kuhlman P asked me, what about how to serialize and deserialize uh, hierarchical uh, POJO hierarchies from into JSON using JSON B? And uh, so, and what I just did, I, I checked out Yasun, which happens to be the um, the reference implementation for JSON B. So this is the Eclipse project, and uh, as you can, Jackson Java X JSON bind example. So it's part of the project. Is this is the this is the um, canonical Java e resource? And uh, what you can see here, there are there are several um, <coughs> uh, several examples. So we have the author. We have the book, and we have the language. So, and uh, and this is somehow a little, at least a, somehow hierarchical structure. And what uh, what happens here? It just uses uh, the uh, with you know with um, it just serializes in deserializes, for instance, the uh, the books from to JSON. So this is the runtime example, and it also so shows how to customize the mapping. So um, it works out of the box. So if you like, t take a look at the examples. So check out the um, the uh, JSON B examples from GitHub. This is what I did. And uh, yeah, and they're just the first example was hierarchical structure. I hope this is the answer to your question. Perfect. So the next one, uh, good morning, Adam. So Veneto, ask me, so there's a mix of different programming languages like Bash, K Shell, Perl, Python, and the question is uh, how to build, you know, uh, uh, pipelines with that. And I actually don't use any of these languages. What I do, I use the uh, pipeline as a code feature from Jenkins um, two, and uh, what what it means is uh, there is a going to be a Jenkins file inside the uh, project. So this is actually what I did in the testing workshop. Uh, um, a few weeks ago at the um, airport Munich. So what I did is um, I, I, I created on the fly a Jenkins file and the Jenkins file just uh, built the projects, tested the project and and uh, and um, and um, created the microservice, shipped the microservice, performed the system test and so forth. And um, there are actually two possibilities. The one is uh, using the uh, Jenkins file scripting mode so where you can the full control of the environment. This is uh, groovy still. You can, of course, use Java because it's groovy. So you can mix Java and groovy. And uh, the next one is like groovy in DSL mode with a little bit more restricted mode, but uh, it is a cleaner, cleaner one. So what, what I do is um, where possible, I always use the Jenkins file DSL mode because it's cleaner and more restrictive. 
and if there is no prop, uh, possible, I just switch to the scripting mode. So I don't, I don't use the embedded scripts within the Jenkins file, and um, I never used other programming languages. So what this means is sometimes, of course, if there is complex stuff to do, what you can do, you can create bash scripts, and you can call from Jenkins file the shell script, like with sh. This is the command. So um, if there is no, no some, you know. Uh, well, you know, using uh, keys, um, for instance, uh, we had to check out code, from instance, and or or create a create a create a, create a, uh, a branch. Sometimes it is easier to use uh, the native uh, Git client instead of using a DSL a Jenkins file. So this is what I do. So again, start with Jenkins DSL. If it's not sufficient, use uh, Jenkins uh, file scripting mode. If this is not sufficient, just call bash files. Or, or Z shell. So Ark and Root asked me, uh, following light for j suggestion for your Java missions. Yeah, my Java mission. So by the way, I don't really have a Java mission. So I'm actually trying, you know, to make my clients happy. And what my clients would like to do is just to implement their business stuff as quickly as possible. And then don't, don't care a lot about the technology anymore. And if uh, so, what I do is I try to find, you know, the most popular and the most boring technology on earth. And usually this is Java E. So I, um, I use Java E, whatever server they have. And we start without any dependencies. Um, why that? Because we can just, you know, uh, we can, any other uh, developer can just pick up the project. And if there are no dependencies, there is nothing to migrate. So, and this one, what you're suggesting here is a very specific uh, framework or tool which implements out of the box uh, the um, CQRS pattern from, from microservices. Having said that, usually, I don't have these problems yet in my projects. So what we sometimes have is, you know, how to how to reliably communicate between microservices. And usually what I prefer to do is to use JMS in case uh, the uh, JMS server is already clustered and available in the projects. For instance, in my current project, um, the, there was a question, now we have, uh, we would like to use mes messaging between um, microservices. What do you will suggest, Kafka or whatever? So like before I, um, I, I will have to install Kafka, I would rather like to rely on existing JMS server. Is this something out there? And there is. So uh, we are just evaluating the possibility to access remotely the JMS server. This is already clustered and reliable and is already operated properly. So we will use stock JMS. And with uh, JMS context from JMS 2.0, it is very easy to send and receive messages. So um, use the um, old boring JMS instead of new exciting Kafka. But um, I'm too lazy to install stuff in case something old and boring is already available. Okay, so this is about that. So um, I will come back to this topic in case I get a customer problem or customer challenge and uh, it, it isn't possible to solve it with JMS. Then I will look at that and uh, um, and and I will show you what, what you can do with Kafka. And by the way, in the next workshop, we will use Kafka just for fun. But uh, just for fun is no different mode of operations. Um, so uh, Kelsey's Kelsas ask me, say you have 40K of rows of data that you want to use in GSF autocomplete components. How best can you handle the data retrieval to enhance performance? So I had I had to, to do something similar uh, ways back, actually, this was years back. And um, what I did is I started with unit test and uh, a named query on JPA because I had to use JPA back then. And there are several hundred thousands uh, data sets and I had to do something like Google suggest. So, um, you know, if you if you write, for instance, M, there would be a, like, uh, you know, uh, Munich will come back and probably, you know, um, uh, uh, what else? Um, Monaco, Munich, and Münster, and um, and if you if you for instance uh, type M U like Uber, you know U E U, then uh, it will suggest uh, Münster and Munich or <laughs> München <laughs> at least. <laughs> okay, and um, so what I did first is I I wrote uh, an integration test, actually not a unit test, and to see whether the the query is performance at all performant enough. 
And then if you have the query, you can execute the query. You can suggest, you know, in the GSF autocomplete. It's not like yeah, you will load into GSF autocomplete, uh, you know, the, the whole thing, <laughs> 40,000 K and uh, just pick it up. So I did it online. And there, um, usually the next question is, would you like to implement it by yourself, which is not a big deal, but the question why, or use, for instance, prime faces for that, where you get ready to use component, which uh, would be my preference in case your client or users like the components. And um, thank you for watching my stuff. Um, so, logging and diagnostic context. Another question from Veneta, with, which is uh, with nice doc and... Uh, the question is, um, operations pains like, uh, he, what, what to do is if you have socket timeout without any context. So in my eyes, you should test that up front. So what I, I don't think it is possible to have a magic switch which dumps everything out um, because it usually is too much information, particular. So I don't have the problem that uh, exception happened and I don't know what, to, what happens or what usually happens to me is like we have some performance concurrency or deadlock bug robustness bug and uh, now you know how to get the context because if we switch everything on you know the logging on uh, the application uh, will be just serialized so there will be no more concurrency and usually the bug disappears which is called heisen bug so what i would like to do is uh, i would actually like to test that so um and uh what i actually did back then there is a project called snail and uh, two years ago, and what Snail is, is like uh, an interceptor, which which artificially slows down, slows down your application. And what you can do, you can test your, your timeouts uh, with that, for instance. And um, so I built it for exactly this purpose to see what happens in case your application becomes too slow. And then you can provide more context information. So what I would rather like to do is to test you know, the problems and provide additional information without overwhelming the, the user or operator instead of relying on magic switches. Um, so, because, you know, to, 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 to write all exceptions, the question is, do the exception have enough, you know, context information like messages? Um, so um, I would rather test the failures. And this is um, if you if if you watch the stuff. So what I uh, said over and over again, you know, unit tests and integration tests are nice, but stress tests are really really important because then you see the problems and you can really easily emulate the problems. This was actually the performance workshop what I what I did last year and repeat in in winter. So what we did, we just overloaded the server and watched the exceptions. And the question is, do we have you know enough context information? So uh, I have questions about monitoring EGB transactions. Is it possible to list current active transactions? Absolutely it is. Usually the application servers are able to provide you a list of active transactions. And uh, for instance, in the Payara case, uh, you have to monitor the transactions subsystem and you will see actually a list of uh, transactions IDs, which is a live list. And um, when it was started and what class method fired it up this is a little bit harder because uh you know uh in, in a live system there couldn't be several thousand transactions per second actually in my uh, uh one of my uh clients last year uh wanted to have a system with uh I actually for, we at least we had to, we had to to uh to to handle four thousand transactions per node so um and i forgot how, how big was the cluster so imagine you know how to monitor that so you have a live system like you know how to visualize several thousand transactions per second in real time so um and um so how to deal with that so what what um i forgot the name actually in in the green book what i did is i uh implemented an interceptor and the interceptor, this is um, rethinking best practices. This is the green book. And in this green book, I introduced an interceptor. And this is, um, uh, and the interceptor um, renamed the threat. Um, and, and, and it used the name of the boundary. And the name of the boundary was the threat. So if something happened to the, to the, uh, to the um, to the boundary, you can at least you know 
have a hip uh, st stack trace and you would see you know by the name of the thread which is normal name of the thread rather than uh, the, the name of the method and you would see actually uh, what what the name of the method of the problematic method is and usually a thread and transactions are the same in, in the architecture because the boundary starts a new transaction and the transaction runs synchronously in the thread and um, No, I think I blocked about that. So if you go to my block, let's see, thread. Ten years old. This is exactly the code. And this is uh, exactly ten years old. So as you can see, this is the um, interceptor. And what it does, it picks the method name. It uh, renames the current thread invokes the method and then renames it back and what you see then a list of all transactions um, as a list of methods so something like this uh, could be helpful and the next is um, additional in this days i'm looking for a free tool to monitor jms queues i mean monitor uh to m there is a tool an old tool called hermes jms i think yeah very old hermes and this is like you can uh, monitor what's going on in the queues um, what you can also have is queue browser is a regular uh, java class coming from java jms api and you can monitor the contents of, of the queue and um, and if you have uh, particular servers like uh, whitefly or glassfish or payara or tommy what you can still do is jmx of course because uh, the jms servers usually are built in java and they expose lots of jmx monitoring capabilities so to uh, to play with the jms like with jdbc content the hermes jms is the right tool and to monitor the performance, I would rely on JMX because most of the JMS servers expose their stuff via JMX. So, wonderful code in Afterburner. So, I'm trying to implement a solution for a table view holding 1000 to 2000 columns. And the problem is it just breaks down. Um, I would say the problem is probably uh, the tables are not decide, designed to have 2000 columns. You have 2000 columns in a few rows, you know. The uh, situation can escalate, and what I get is, what I think, what happens is, uh, you get some problems with the native, native widgets. So I would say uh, I wouldn't attempt to to have that many columns. So, so just imagine you have to, to scroll two thousand columns. You have to sc scroll on the right and left sides. I, I would I would just create either a custom component, or rethink you know the design because I don't think the table header and the uh, and the tables are designed. To hold 2,000 columns. So, Elite BTD asked me, "What is my opinion on using REST web service to authenticate and authorize users in multiple web apps on an internet?" Yeah, you have to do this. And uh, what usually, uh, what what you should do is the JWT JSON Web Token if you can, and it is already supported by the. Uh, security API from Java 8, which can be used in Java 7. And uh, there are several patterns. One of the patterns like having like a like a boundary or parameter facade or facade, whatever, or, or entry service gateway, whatever you would call it. And uh, this uh, service would would translate, you know, the J JWT token to internal calls, for instance. But um, I would say Authenticate and authorize user in REST web services. Usually the JWT or JOT is the way to go because it's also well integrated with JavaScript frameworks. And uh, this is this is the point. Like you would like to auth authenticate and authorize from your uh, web app. So is there any way to marshal Java, Java JSON objects uh, from uh, like with Jax B? Of course it is. It's, it's called JSON B and we already covered that. 
So recently I decided to give a try on ECB control boundary pattern and I have some doubts. Where do I put my exceptions and exceptions mappers if I have to create them? So uh, the exceptions usually happens in entities or controls or boundaries and they are related to the business logic from controls, boundaries or entities. So just put the exceptions close to the entities, controls and on, on boundaries and do not create your own exception packages. Just take a look, for instance, exception r objects i think was the blog post yeah so let's take a look at this blog post what i did is uh, i just tried to explain you know uh, treat the exceptions are objects and they're nothing special so then 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 just hold the exceptions close to uh, entities controls or boundaries so i will handle exceptions like enums for instance so this would be my way to go it's like uh yeah okay If I need a repository or some utility classes, where it goes? Repository is nothing special, it's just control. So I do not make any difference between repositories, DAOs or whatever. Oh, DAOs is special thing. Data access object. What uh, When I need data access objects in case I have to, to, to um, communicate with unusual uh, unusual resource, like for instance, you know, LDAP or flat files or a NoSQL database or Kafka or Kafka is already well integrated with APIs, but let's say, uh, you know, a strange uh, resource or an old resource, legacy resource, I would create DAO for that, for, for JPA, entity manager, and no DAOs are needed. Um, so, and where it goes, it is just a control and it is, uh, and it, you don't need any abstract classes or there is nothing to do. Uh, how, how I would, how would a large application with several modules be organized in this pattern? So there's already a YouTube screencast about that, but I, th I think I'm, I'm not really satisfied with the with the screencast. I'll probably re-record re that because I get many questions about that. So large application will comprise several packages and the packages are named about the concepts, uh, after the concepts. For instance, you would have like order package and you would have a address package and tax taxation package and uh, the packages are the components and they can communicate with each other and um, if there are too many packages then you would create another war which con 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 contains several packages and then we have microservices do you think that jsf is going to be duplicated anytime soon no i think uh, jsf is still great if you can live with the components server-side rendering is an option and uh, I don't think uh, whether it's going to be deprecated. It's just, uh, I like the technology and um, not only, I like the technology, lots of startups really like JSF because uh, it's very productive. So the problem is it's misused by, uh, in many corporations, you know, to implement everything. And uh, uh, JSF cannot be pixel perfect. If you pick, for instance, you know, prime faces, there are, there are for instance, some pre-assumptions, how it looks and feels, so you cannot change it a lot. So you cannot just, you know, uh, transform a table to a tree. So there, there, this is where the trouble starts. And there are trends, you know, React or Angular, or uh, the next trend is my clients try to, you know, to skip the frameworks and just use the web standards because if you pick a framework, the question is how long this, this framework is going to be around. And um, in some of my projects, we have both. We have used JSF uh, applications for back office um, and, and uh, on, for instance, one project React and the other projects uh, web standards for pixel perfect uh, uh, clients. Okay, the next one is uh, JSF 1.2 and CDI bin and um, some things with Java Roaster. I think the Java Roaster is like a Java parsing library from Red Hat, I think. And I have to migrate HGB 2 to 3 and this is Java standard project with no more supported by Whitefly 8. Uh, Entity beans are no longer supported. What is your suggestion about this specific kind of migration process? I found some migration tools, but final, finally no one works well. Yeah, of course, no, nothing will work well. So take a look whether it's called, I think, local home. No. Uh, I, I think I have a migration post, should be also 10 years old. 
So we will have to take a look at that. So just to, to search local home, remote home. So the point is EJB3 or EJB2 with one annot annotation called remote home can be very easily transformed into EGB3. This was my trick. So I will just keep the interfaces, this, uh, the uh, local home and remote home interfaces, and then transform the uh, just the EGB2 into EGB3 three by adding the interface, uh, the annotation. And I think it's called remote home annotation. Yes. And with that annotation, an EGB2 becomes an EGB3, and you can de delete already the deployment descriptors, so which is a big deal. And then with uh, Entity Beans, what I did with Entity Beans, so back then we had to use Xdoclet. I hope you are also using Xdoclet, because what Xdoclet did, it uh, generated value objects. This was a wrongly named data transfer objects, so they were not value objects rather than data transfer object, but it was provided out of the box by Xdoclet. And the uh, and the value objects, if you look at them, they are basically very similar to JPA. So we just uh, let Xdoclet generate the value objects from entities. All the dependencies were already covered. Then we put some annotations on the on the uh, value objects, and and we got a JPA, and we just deleted the entity beans. This was one manual strategy. The other one was it was a BA project. And BA wrote all the persistence mapping in, I think it was called WebLogic CMP or something, Diploma Descriptor. And if you if you look at the descriptor, all the information you need is already there. So we, we wrote a code generator with, which, which read the XML file and generated the POJOs. It sounds complicated, but it was actually very simple. And we used uh, we used Jax B and uh, how it's called, not free marker velocity um, and uh, right now you could even use um, NAS1 for that so this could work so um, how should I use JDBC data source given by container uh, yeah you just inject data source call get connection uh, you have to close it because if you close the connection it is going to be returned to the pool so you have to close it um, yeah, you can close whatever you like, but uh, you have to close the connection. So uh, 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 if you don't close the, or you can use the closable, auto-closable with try with resources. Are SQL queries invoked in current GTA transactions? Yes, they are. Uh, uh, the GDBC data source, what you also should do is to use the same GDBC data source as the entity manager uses, so they could even participate in the same transaction. Throwing exceptions, rollbacks, transaction. Throwing exceptions. So yeah, if the exceptions, so if the if an exception is thrown, the transaction is going to be rolled back. But SQL exception is not a uh, checked exception. As uh, it is a checked exception, not a runtime exception. So SQL exception will not will not roll back the transactions. But you, hence it is because it is not a runtime exception. You are you you will have to catch the SQL exception. And and rethrow it as runtime, for instance, or web application exception. But you can what you can do is you can just you know roll back the transaction. So Arian Arian Teams uh, just uh, uh, says um, answers the question with the GSF, and he he is very also very posit positive about the uh, the uh, GSF future and. The, 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 the um, remaining remark about JSF future is uh, it is also about the community. So if no one is interested in JSF anymore, regardless how good it is, it will die. So this is also an, an, an problem, right? So, and um, on 5th, 5th March, he asked me, could you please take a look at the project's uh, JSF test? And yes. So I check it out. So uh, first, POM looks great as it should be. One dependency Java 7 and uh, prime faces. So and then um, we have one JSF page and we have uh, control entity exception ambient. So first, what is lacking? Uh, the component name. So there is no component. Next one, there should be no exception. So if you take a look, unique person exception, we have person. So the exception in my eyes should be here. 
should be inside the person. So what's so M bin, so person bin is just for the mapping. Uh, this is not yeah you could you could uh, yeah. So if you like, just do this cleaner. Uh, it doesn't have a session scope, okay? Uh, the question, do you need session? Then it should be uh, serializable. Uh, person, new person. Okay, you could do this. Instead of this, I would do that. Const. So uh, it creates the session and then uh, writes the message. Okay, you could do the message this way, or I would just inject, uh, expose a, a getter setter with the message. So that you, you can, yeah. And and then I wouldn't call it mbin. Rather than what I will do, I would have here two packages. So one is called business uh, persons, for instance. And actually, all the things here are going here into persons. And there's, and then this is going to be refactor rename uh, presentation. So, and now we have the presentation with person bean. So it's nice, and uh, I would rather call it um, index view because it is related to index and uh, yeah you can name it person or not so this is my feedback about the code organization and uh, of course delete this and uh, the cool story is now I, we can have rest services here and we have the index view here so we have control entity and there is no boundary so this is the next thing so usually you would like to have your boundary new java class persons dot boundary and let's call it person store and the boundary is stateless and um, yeah this is the problem this is actually a boundary not a control so there are no controls delete yes present session then no one is interested in the session so just call it store or whatever it does this is not needed because there is only one and flash this is true so you you have to uh, invoke flash in case to um provoke the exception so the exception happens earlier with that and then you can throw unique person exception but the unique person exception my eyes should be for instance a runtime exception uh, or yeah runtime exception in this case so runtime exception yeah okay so this is what I will do and equals in hash code on entities is not necessarily required and to string okay so a little bit of cleanup and of course don't do this return the name and we know what getters and setters are so now we are a little bit cleaner and not in that index <laughs> index so this was my feedback but the question is is this a good approach when developing gsf application yes um if i don't call business exceptions not thrown is calling flash a correct way yes if you would like to see the exceptions earlier cool so now uh bet xaburu ask me about jason b again and we already answered exactly the question already and um the last one is um is uh, what about uh async in my videos so what i did i recorded a video here a longer time ago and what i do in the video i create an asynchronous uh, client with 
completable future. And uh, why I did it? Because I got lots of questions on you know, how to be have to asynchronous uh, communication without you know allocating too many threads. So I just showed you what it does. And what I also did, I did the same. I did the same uh, in my microservices course, Java EE microservices, Java EE micro dot services. So uh, exactly. So this is. Uh, with it builds a full pipeline with that so if you're interested in this take a look at this course and um what uh what i wanted to say is it just works in all my cases so um i just tested with all the servers and using production and it just works so um I, it's really hard to tell what the problem is uh, and why it doesn't work for you but if it waits, it means uh, the server just blocks and there is no response. And what it also happens, I guess in my example, I didn't caught the exception. So if you do not handle the exceptions in the asynchronous pipeline, the exceptions are going to be swallowed and you will wait forever. So this might be the reason why it does not work in your case. And why it doesn't, is the question though. What, what you should do is um, uh, just introduce a handle exception or a peak to see what happens, or um, how, is, how, is, how is it called, um, handle peak, and on arrow, I think. There are there are several several methods in the, in the completable future API. Just enhance my example with that, and you will, should be able to catch the exception on the server side. So, okay, so thank you. See you at upcoming workshops, and um, in April, if you like, this is just uh, in, uh, around the corner. Or in winter, um, or uh, in, in, in autumn, if you would like to see how to build uh, web apps with uh, routing offline capabilities, like, you know, uh, Swing with WebStart without Swing and WebStart just with JavaScript. So um, thank you for watching and see your conferences, workshops, projects, and um, yeah, um, enjoy, enjoy the spring. Okay, bye.